In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and in no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. This is the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution, and it's more important than it seems. When our society discusses issues politely, with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. For many hundreds of years, common law has been the guiding force in America. It predates the English colonization of North America by around 600 years, and the imperialism which began under the English monarchy and continued after the English kings became the British kings in 1707, exported common law with every colony established. Common law isn't a bad system at all. It simply states that legal decisions must be based upon such past decisions which apply to that case a concept known as precedence. This is the reason why law libraries contain anywhere from dozens to thousands of books documenting every case. It's also why lawyers must be experienced researchers if they want to achieve great success, and why judges often spend quite a bit of time researching their decision and writing it down before they present it. If a precedent exists, then the court is generally bound to rule according to that precedent. The legal term for this is stare decisis. Now, if a party brings a suit before a federal court, then that court is bound to follow the legal precedents of cases within that circuit. This is why civil lawsuits are sometimes filed in specific circuits, especially when challenging the actions of the federal government. For instance, the Fifth Circuit is staffed by judges appointed by primarily Republican presidents, while the Ninth Circuit is filled with about two and a half times as many Democrat appointees. Challenges to the actions of a Democrat president tend to come from the Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, and Eighth Circuits. Challenges to a Republican president tend to come from the 1st, 2nd, 4th, 9th, 11th, and D.C. circuits. The 9th Circuit is especially powerful when it comes to challenging conservative policies, as it is much larger than the other circuits and geographically far away from Washington, D.C. Distance adds to the difficulty of responding to challenges filed in this court. The D.C. Circuit is also critical, as it is the court with original jurisdiction for federal agencies and lobby firms can file challenges almost before the ink dries on presidential signatures. This is the most important reason that civil suits have the protection of a jury trial if $20 or more is involved. Without that guarantee of trial by a jury of peers, petitioners would rely upon the judges, which would make stare decisis more insurmountable. Judges aren't absolutely bound to obey precedent under common law if the precedents are unworkable, meaning that a cultural change over time can change the decisions of the judges. However, these cases are rare and judges are very careful when establishing new precedent. But is that the only way to change precedent? To wait until societal norms change enough to overturn them? Um, no. Just no. Juries can establish new precedent in civil trials, and they do, all of the time. Georgia v. Brailsford, 1794, Chief Justice John Jay, back in the days when the members of the Supreme Court traveled to their assigned circuit courts to preside over cases, instructed the jury that they were supposed to decide the facts of the case, not the law, but that they might decide both. It took 105 years before that precedent was overturned by the Supreme Court. Harkness v. Transworld Airlines, 1958. A jury in Los Angeles decided that TWA and United Airlines were liable for wrongful death damages when two airliners collided over the Grand Canyon, killing over 100 people. The jury decided that evidence presented in dozens of individual suits could be presented collectively in all of those suits, establishing the precedent for class action lawsuits. Grimshaw v. Ford Motor Company, 1978 the famous Ford Pinto case, which established that companies could not decide if they were going to recall vehicles for safety defects based on financial reasons. Liebeck v. McDonald's Restaurants, 1994. Similar to the Ford Pinto case, the McDonald's coffee case established corporate liability for serving coffee too hot to drink, creating a safety hazard which could not be ignored, again, for financial reasons. 
Do you think that these are standout cases for federal jury trials? While they may be a bit more memorable, they are just a few examples of hundreds, even thousands, of instances in which juries establish precedents in common law. But what about the $20 clause? Why $20? There isn't much discussion of this clause, but I have my own opinion as to why it was set at 20 bucks. At the time, the Supreme Court was the only federal court. The justices, as I said before, traveled from courthouse to courthouse in between sessions to hear cases. Jury trials tend to take longer than trials by judges alone. The framers wanted to keep small claims, should they cross state lines and thus fall under federal jurisdiction, from requiring a jury trial, to save valuable time for the justices, who had to move on to their next stop as soon as they cleared their docket. I plugged $20 into an online calculator which estimates the value of that amount in today's money and discovered that it is equal to about $2,100 now. As the value of money decreased over time, there were two possible solutions to the $20 clause, either to amend the Constitution to reflect the equivalent amount in today's money, which would have been difficult, or to amend the structure of the court to accommodate the increased workload as a larger population resulted in more and more cases. The circuits retained the name established when the justices rode from courthouse to courthouse in a round trip to and from Washington, D.C., but they are fundamentally different in structure than they were when the Constitution was ratified. That was the easiest and most workable solution. Now, I realize that this episode is a lot shorter than my episodes usually are, even my episodes on the Bill of Rights and the other amendments to the Constitution. However, that is not to say that the Seventh Amendment is not important. It establishes the right in constitutional law for the citizens of the United States to have access to a jury trial even in civil cases, at least insofar as they appear in federal court. These protections aren't guaranteed in other jurisdictions. For that matter, they're not even guaranteed in state courts. So it's important for Americans to also study their state constitutions and their state judicial system to understand what rules apply in their case. Now that's just my opinion. Comment below to share yours. If you like this video, check out my playlists. Check out these channels I have subscribed for more great content. New episodes are coming, so subscribe and ring the bell.